I hope some of you are spending the day at the Humanities Festival as an alternative to watching Nick Walenda walk between two buildings <laughs> blindfolded. Although I have to tell you, when the Chicago Humanities Festival writes people like me and says, well, we want you to give a lecture with uh, no written text, it's like walking between a building on a high wire blindfolded. <laughs> so uh, I'm not quite going to do that, but uh, here we are. Um, I'm delighted to be part of the Chicago Humanities Festival and uh, to have a chance to think a little bit with you today about travel and geopolitics. And I'm also delighted that this lecture is part of a sequence today of three lectures, uh, the next by Gordon Chan and then by Elizabeth Hutchinson. And I think if you go to all three, you will see that they are all interconnected um, in very interesting ways. I also think it's really cool that at a conference on journeys, I'm sponsored by an airline. <laughs> and also my favorite airline, I love Southwest. I flew on them yesterday to get here. And I think they're the best airline because they have free baggage and open seating. So you don't have to be ruby, sapphire, diamond, gold, et cetera, to get on, get on the plane. <laughs> so I love Southwest, and we should all fly them as much as we can. <laughs> now, some of you might know the work I've done on uh, travel and travel writing and uh, their relationship to European imperialism in Africa and South America and what I've called the arts of the contact zone. What I'm going to talk about today is not travel writing per se, but some things I've learned from thinking about travel and travel and human mobility and its representations over several decades. So I'm hoping to offer some ways of thinking about, to enable us to think about our movements uh, in the world, in all our worlds, big ones and small ones. So in March 2001, I happened to be in Buenos Aires in the midst of what you might remember as their epic financial meltdown. Banks were closed. Uh, the, nobody had any money. Commerce was virtually impossible. And people were kind of faking normalcy by circulating around in stores. But no one could buy anything, and no one could sell them anything. Women in fur coats were sitting out in the street trying to sell their jewelry for money to buy food. It was a, just an incredible, amazing situation. And one morning, on the front page of the Buenos Aires newspaper, there appeared a picture, a photograph. And it was a man posed as a classic Argentine gaucho, dressed in a traditional poncho. Um, this is the figure. This isn't the one in the newspaper, but this is the, the type. Mounted on horseback, traditional poncho, sombrero, and so on. And this man was going to ride around the perimeter of Argentina, and there's Argentina, on horseback, depending for his subsistence, without money, depending for his subsistence on the hospitality of his fellow citizens. That iconography then, the man, the horse, the sombrero, left no doubt that this, this was an experiment in mobility you knew it was an experiment in mobility aimed to reaffirm the ideal of the nation, to reenact nation as a grid of hospitality, um, a gift, as a gift economy separate from money, commerce, debt, banks. So the ride, this ride around the periphery, was going to perform the nation as territory and as collectivity in the flesh of the man and the horse and their hosts. And I underscore there the role of the hypothetical hosts in this project. Because talk, when we talk about journeys and travel, we almost inevitably, just by habit of mind, organize our talk around the traveler, the agency of the traveler. That's the protagonist of the trip. And we tend to lose track of the extent, it's easy to lose track of the extent to which acts of moving <coughs> exist in, and have meaning in relation to other people's acts of staying, of being there, right? So what I want to suggest today is that with almost any journey, those relations between who's moving and who's staying can just about always serve as a rough guide to geopolitics, to the geopolitics in play in the situation. The French cultural theorist Michel de Certeau wrote a wonderful book a long time ago now called The Practice of Everyday Life. It's a really wonderful read. He talks about how in our lives, stories of travel 
and this is a quote, he says, interminably labor to compose spaces, to verify, collate, collate and displace their frontiers. In his words then, that the gaucho, our gaucho writer, let me go back to him, would be composing the space of Argentina, verifying and collating its frontiers as a bounded whole, and as a civic collectivity independent of finance. Now, host-guest relations play a constitutive role in much of what we think of as travel. And by constitutive, I mean not something that's collateral or incidental, but that is integral and essential to the phenomenon that makes it what it is. So most journeys are organized as movements between points of hospitality. That is, points where the movers are received and sustained by the stayers. And the presence and hosting capacity of those stairs, or the lack of those things, usually determines the, the traveler's route. So host-guest relations in the Argentinian traveler's case are, not, are essential not only to the logistics of the trip, but also to its meaning. Pilgrimage, which is another kind of journey. Oh, I'm going the wrong way here. Let me get to my guy. Pilgrimage, here we go. Another kind of journey is also nearly always imagined as an act carried out by the pilgrim or the pilgrims. But anyone who's participated in a pilgrimage, has anyone participated in a pilgrimage here? Some people may have. Anyone who's participated in a pilgrimage knows that um, it, it consists of a serial enactment of relations between pilgrims, the pilgrims, and the people who also as a sacred uh, action, sustain them as they go. So that interaction is not incidental to the pilgrimage, but integral to its sacred meaning. So we get to a general question. What can we learn by thinking of travel and mobility, not as the moving of a body or set of bodies in space, but as the enactment or unfolding of relations between placed bodies and displaced bodies? How does that make us rethink the architecture of travel, the idea of the journey, and what insight does it give us to geopolitics? Now, Dusserteau, who I quoted a minute ago, he was interested in everyday life practices of moving and staying. And these practices, he says, or he was interested in the way, and he, as he said, that those organize more or less extensive social cult and cultural areas. Think, for example, of visiting. There's a practice that involves an organized arrangement of bodies that move and bodies that stay. Someone must be at home with the grandchildren when grandma arrives. A so there's a social division of labor in visiting that involves a high potential, a high possibility of reciprocity. I visit you this week, you visit me next week. Except, of course, in pathological situation where someone is institutionally confined, hospital, prison. Visiting, otherwise, enacts those host-guest relations that belong to the gift economy. And they're valued for being non-commercial. We value them for being non-commercial or for pretending to be non-commercial as in this thing called the hospitality industry. Now, in some places, visiting has the status of a formal public good. In small towns in North America, like the one I'm from, the newspaper, the local newspaper, will still print every week who visited who last week. <laughs> visiting, beca why? Because visiting performs collective life, and it performs it in kind of a dance of movers and stayers. Now, commerce is organized that way, too. Traditional buying and selling also takes the form of people moving and people staying in organized interaction, in an organized way. In, in uh, markets, oh, why am I going the wrong way? Sorry. Here we go. So in stores, markets, malls, commerce takes place with vendors who sit with the wares, and the buyers circulate among them examining the goods, enacting their freedom to choose, 
and, leave it, and they leave carrying their purchases. Interestingly enough, those arrangements change dramatically when money is not involved. A few years ago, I went to a Saturday market in a small town in Morelos in Mexico. And in this particular town, there were a lot of people, as in many rural towns in Mexico, who really don't have, have very, very little money and don't really work much with money. So the town had decided that alongside its Saturday market, cash market, it would set up a barter market adjacent to it, to which you, a person could bring anything that they grew, harvested, or made, and exchange it for other things that other people grew, harvested, or made. The cash market, this is what they found out when they tried to organize this. The cash market required that the moving buyers far outnumber the vendors. Um, I have to sell a lot to a lot of people to make a profit and be able to renew my business. And you remember how it feels to be in a store where there's more salespeople than customers? Like, this is not good. In the barter market, though, in the barter market, you the organizers discovered you had to have an equal number of sitters and walkers to give everyone an equal chance to exchange with everyone else. And that's what made it fair. This was a new dance that they had to learn in the community how to execute and how to administer it. And that difference kind of, kind of captures the fundamental difference between reciprocal exchange, barter, and profit-oriented cash. And interestingly, in the barter market, the most popular item for exchange was flowers. Now, war is another more or less extensive cultural area that is organized around leaving and staying, right? Warriors go off to fight. Children, women, children, and elders, not women go to now, children stay behind. The warriors make the war. But that framing distorts war by ignoring the war-making roles of those of us who stay behind. The people who stay behind have to take over the functions that the departing warrior will no longer be care fulfilling, and they have to do extra work or suffer scarcity or pay higher taxes to supply the warriors as they engage in, this, in the high consumption activity of war making. There are few more high consumption activities than war making. Now here again, our shared common sense defines things in reference to the person who goes and tends to overlook, then, the agency of those who don't go, of the stayers. Now, just thinking about this a little bit longer, I started, I found myself, I had to ask myself, is there um, a, an instance in everyday life where staying behind is the privileged practice? And the one example I came up with was inheritance. In the common system of inheritance called primogeniture, eldest sons, the eldest son inherits the father's property or his trade or his profession or his titles, his status. The eldest sons inherit. And the, younger son, the daughters and younger sons have to find their way, go out and find their way. And book lovers, which, of which there have to be many in this room, encounter those second and third sons all over the place in travel books and novels of empire, and novels. Robinson Crusoe is one of the originals. Here's how he starts. He says, being the third son of the family and not bred to any trade, my head began to fill very early with rambling thoughts. You'd be amazed how often then those wandering second and third sons show up in the literature of adventure and empire. That might, this primogeniture might sound like a thing of the past, but it's a very, a form that's very um, alive and well. It's the reason that I'm here and not where I grew up. Primogeniture, how many of you here grew up in, the, in a family or community that had a primogeniture system where eldest sons inherited? Not a lot of hands going up. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Primogeniture systems organize property relations by ensuring that one person stays, whether he wants to or not, and not, but that not everybody stays, which they economically cannot. 
So there are lots of areas of everyday social and economic life that are organized by relations of going and staying. But modern metropolitan imaginations like ours are trained to focus on the movers. And we, ha we all have what Jennifer French might call something like an imaginative quarantine on staying. Uh, that bias is kind of inherent, for example, in the very idea of progress that lies at the heart of modernity. Remember Pilgrim's progress. So we come back to our question. What insights can we gain by interrupting some of those habits of our imagination? In 1972, which is a long time ago, a friend and I uh, spent one summer traveling from San Francisco to Rio de Janeiro, and we made the trip overland. It took us two and a half months, and it cost us about $450, a long time ago. Um, we mainly followed the Pan American Highway, although you have to, it doesn't, there's some breaks in it, and went down Central America and then down the coast, west coast of South America. And we got, when we got to Lima in Peru, we had to leave the Pan American Highway and turn inland and to go up to the Andes, Cusco, uh, in order to cross Lake Titicaca and go down through Bolivia and across Argentina up through Paraguay to get to Brazil. This was not a mysterious route. There was only one possible road at that time, 1972, and only one travel guide. This was before there was tourism of any extent in South America. When we got to Lima, and we started to tell people we were going to the Sierra, we met over and over again, we, had, we met people giving us the same response. They would, the response was, why would you want to go there? And of course, our reaction was, how could you not want to go there, right? I was, my response was that, and it had with it a kind of smugness. We were, they were unenlightened, uninformed, ethnocentric, uncurious, in an oppressive culture, trammeled by norms and convention, <laughs> conventions that I was free of. I was acting out in the most thoughtless way, Western modernity's deeply entrenched equation of mobility and travel with freedom and enlightenment or sophistication. And I was acting that out with a tremendous sense of entitlement that comes with it. And it comes especially hand to hand with being North American and white. It never crossed my mind that maybe I had no business going to the Andes, which I'm sure the Limenos were thinking that maybe the Andeans had no interest in having me come visit them, or in providing me for, me for me while I was there, like helping me through altitude sickness. Nor did it occur to me that I might have ethical, cultural, economic, ecological responsibilities in the places that I was passing through, or that I was in any way accountable to these people, their labor, their resources, and their places. So how about the geopolitics of that? And in fact, once we got there to the Andes, staggering, people kept asking us, why are you here? <laughs> In the modern Western imagination, mobility is a privileged figure for freedom. Karen Kaplan calls that the modernist myth of travel. We all inhabit it. The textbook Western subject or model of personhood is, is of an autonomous being defined by a set of inalienable rights that attach to its body wherever that body may be. <coughs> Robinson Crusoe. There he is. There's Robinson. Mobility, unfetteredness, is the proof and performance of that liberated autonomous state which is kind of hilarious because no one is less autonomous or needier than travelers. <laughs> but this unfettered mobile state is also uh, the figure for acquiring knowledge as well as exercising freedom. So this subject, me going to the Andes, Shackleton in exploring the South Pole, this subject comes to know the world by venturing into the unknown, moving through it, exploring, following leads, finding her way or his way. 
One current enactment of this myth is in movie theaters now, the movie Tracks, about a young Australian woman who treks 1,500 miles across the Australian outback, uh, accompanied by her dog and three camels. Her goals are to reach the sea, prove she can do a difficult, carry out a difficult challenge she set for herself, and to get away from other people. She's a quest heroine and a quintessential modern mobile subject of the kind that Camus is talking about in that quotation. There's a similar quotation. She fulfills the quotation from Marcel Proust in, the, in our program for the, um, for the uh, festival. Proust says, we don't receive wisdom. We must discover it for ourselves after a journey that no one can take for us, he says. <clears throat> that kind of articulates a matter of what is kind of dogma for many of us. Um, so if you wanted to disrupt that equation of mobility with freedom and knowledge, one thing you can do is ask, well, where is mobility an enactment of unfreedom? What comes to mind? Transatlantic slavery right away. But then in our own lifetimes, what comes to mind are all the other forms of forced displacement that have multiplied and accelerated, in fact, with free market globalization. And that we're more aware of now because of the media revolution. Think about economically forced migration the, with that brutal contest between moving and stasis that it involves. The images we see every day in the papers of um, migrants trying to forced their way over walls or across bodies of water to enter either Europe or the United States. And the images of people dying in large numbers on the way. We can think of the expulsion of rural and forest dwelling peoples all over the planet by mining and timber multinationals. The revival of human trafficking in all its forms, including slavery. Um, there are political practices of kidnapping, exile, and deportation, or that new form of displacement called rendition, extraordinary rendition. Um, there's the flight from war every year that creates refugees by the millions. Um, just thinking about those things helps us not e idealize mobility for its own sake. In some places in Latin America, the term desplazado, displaced, is a, is a formal demographic category, um, as it was in Europe after World War II. It's not an accident that Saskia Sassen's new book um, on, uh, on the global economy is titled Expulsions. So forced mobility is kind of the dark side of travel. Um, and it has long, the dark side of travel has long been a privileged weapon for dispossession and for assaults on collective ways of life. And it has been operating in this way in our lifetimes on an unprecedented scale. So given those kinds of dramas of forced movement and forced entrapment, it's a very painful irony that the privileged metaphor for globalization has been the metaphor of flow. We talk about the increased flow of people, goods, and money, um, or accelerated flow. And to which Warren Buffett was probably right when, he, I think it was Warren Buffett who said, we're really hearing a great sucking sound and maybe some pumps as well. Now, the, that dark side of travel and mobility, you might, as you might call it, comes into view if you juxtapose the, the film Tracks. There she, there's Tracks, this is her with her, this is the film. Um, with another film that was also um, a, an Australian Trek film based on a true story, and many of you will have seen it, The Rabbit Proof Fence. Um, this tells the story of three little girls who in the 1930s were taken by force from their aboriginal mother uh, by colonial authorities and transported to a residential school to be trained as domestic servants. They escape. And in a 12,000 mile trek, they follow the rabbit proof fence that was built across Australia to uh, benefit settlers, and they make their way home. In contrast with tracks, and it's kind of a stark contrast, right? It's almost reductive. 
in, in uh, contrast with tracks, their departure into the unknown, the residential school, is involuntary. It's an abduction. And it involves not liberation, self-realization, enlightenment, or fulfillment, although the colonial authorities forcing it upon them might think that. But in, rather, it involves insertion into a world of exploitation, coercion, and self-annihilation. Their journey across the outback, in both films, the outback is like the valley of the shadow of death that's in every epic, right? Um, in their journey, the girl's journey, the, the aim is not to experience freedom, achievement, self-realization. The aim is getting home, recovering the known, the place of kinship and belonging. So in these two films, the protagonists, they're all female. They ha their, their stamina, know-how, courage, and cunning are deployed in different scripts, both of the scripts linked to settler colonialism. For a long time, as Rabbit Proof Fence attests, indigenous and aboriginal perspectives have been interrupting and contesting that modernist myth of travel. This is contesting this. Whoops, not that, this. <laughs> um, Native American scholar Sandy Grande has put this very bluntly. She says, from her perspective, this is a quotation, the seemingly liberatory constructs of fluidity, mobility, and transgression are perceived not only as the language of critical subjectivity, but also as part of the fundamental lexicon of Western imperialism. That deplaced, ungrounded, fluid subject, the postmodern hero, um, like the protagonist of Tracks, she says, masks colonial power. And in Tracks, she does. If you see the movie, I think you'll agree. In the history of indigenous experience, and Sandy Grande, she wrote a really good book called Red Pedagogy. Um, she, she does this very well. She shows how that, that mobile traveler knower that's, that's a, the, the modernist, the ideal of the, mo the hero of the modernist myth, from in, her, in indigenous experience, turns up as the figure of unsolicited encounter, of invasion. He arrives on horseback, carrying a gun, or a Bible, or surveying instruments, or he arrives in a Jeep with an ethnographer's notepad or a video camera, or, as in Rabbit Proof Fence, with orders to take away the children. So I think we are all probably going to have to give up on that figure as the ideal of freedom, knowledge, achievement, and self-fulfillment and cosmopolitanism. If you're wondering about this, you might want to see Peggy Vale's documentary, The Gringo Trail, which came out in 2013. So as Grande's argument suggests, we could look for other compelling myths and models of subjectivity and other compelling myths and models of mobility that are not built on the dispossession of others. In January 2009, I was participating in a, a seminar um, organized by U the UNESCO uh, um, team on um, intangible heritage. And at the seminar, it was in Oaxaca, in Mexico. And one a participant in the seminar, who was a Mixteco uh, from Mexico, said that his, his ethnic group, the Mixtecos, who are one of Oaxaca's largest indigenous groups, were claiming a new human right, el derecho de no migrar, the right to not migrate. Now, the Mixteco are an ancient Mexican people, and they're very, they were very well known in the present. They are very well known in the present for their incredible resourcefulness and ingenuity in sustaining their communitarian ways of life and organization, even after the NAFTA agreement forced them in large numbers into the migrant stream northwards. Yet now, there they were in 2009, claiming el derecho de no migrar. That, that new right implied, I thought about it, I thought, you know, that implies a kind of new relation between the citizen and the state, a new entitlement, the entitlement not to be forced into the migrant stream, the entitlement, the right 
to a genuine choice about whether you go or stay. It's, and that's an economic choice. It's a new right because modern, in modern states, that entitlement to live in your country was taken for granted. Citizenship was supposed to mean territorial belonging. Staying was the unmarked norm. It was what everyone was supposedly entitled to, although millions of Irish, German, and Italian immigrants to the Americas would tell it differently. But that entitlement in some parts of the world, like Mexico, disappeared in the 1990s with free trade agreements. The Mixtecos claim stands out because, also because the new right they are claiming is not individual, it is also collective. They were arguing as a people, and it's an aggregate of communities. This is us, these are our communities. The demand that we as a collective, collectively not be forced to undergo the dislocations and disruptions of out-migration as they have been inflicted and on all of us mutually, both the ones who stay and the ones who go. So the right attaches to that, not just to individual bodies. So that collective demand called on the state to recognize migration as a mass imposition, not an individual choice. It also called on the state to recognize its complicity in forced migration and to remedy that. So the, in those ways, el derecho de no migrar raises a challenge to that rights discourse I mentioned earlier that attaches to our individual bodies in a way that is intrinsically unplaced. The Misteco proposal bears out the observation that many people are making today that in their indigenous thought and indigenous geopolitics in many, coming from many places in the world are proposing differently defined emancipatory projects that are not framed, that are framed not by what Grande calls Western conceptions of democracy and justice that presume a liberated self, but, as she puts it, by a construct that is also geographically rooted and historically placed. And this is a big challenge to um, metropolitan imaginations. But there is a growing body of contemporary indigenous thought from many parts of the planet that's making an interesting, interesting challenges to mobility as the privileged figure for freedom, empowerment, knowledge, and human fulfillment. Um, these, these thinkers are, are insisting on, and you've all been exposed to this script, on the value of modes of being that ground themselves in whatever place they are in, because we are always in some place, that see humans as neither separate from nor necessarily superior to other forms of life, that regard collective life as essential to self-realization, that find models for plenitude in deep connection to the contours and life forms of the places we inhabit. Their writings today, and this is the interesting development, I think, the writings today of these indigenous thinkers, and I'll mention a few in a minute, are, are no longer directed to indigenous readers or indigenous audiences. These writings are now extroverted. They are directed at all humankind. They are based on the assumption that if we don't fix this now to get, we are in this together and we are all going down together if we don't figure out how to fix our relation to the planet. So this is extroverted indigenous thought. I'm from the Mohawk thinker Taiaki Alfred or the Cree writer Thompson Highway in Canada, the Maori theorist Linda Tuhiwai Smith from New Zealand, uh, in the U.S., activist scholars like Winona LeDuc and Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, Dunbar um, a multitude of Aymara thinkers who have appeared in a, this incredible fluorescence in Bolivia since things changed there. And just, I read yesterday in the New York uh, Review of Books, the Yanomami, that's an Amazonian shaman, Davi Kopenawa, whose thought is appearing in a new book co-authored with the anthropologist Bruce Albert, and the book is called The Falling Sky. 
Now that book began as a series of anguished tape recordings that Kopenawa recorded in Yanomami and, and sent to Albert as his people struggled against a huge invasion of their territory by illegal gold miners, by the tens of thousands in Brazil. That fact suggests something important. It's no accident that alternative, these alternative proposals are coming from people who get called indigenous. Because that term indigenous actually names not a characteristic of a group of people, but a relationship between people who inhabit another location when somebody else arrives uninvited. Nobody is indigenous. Nobody is indigenous till somebody else shows up, right? <laughs> right? It's a relational identity. And that somebody else shows up has to be, is an imperial somebody, not an invited guest, but somebody who arrives to interrupt their lives. So in, indigen, indigeneity, which is a thing a lot of uh, academics are talking about today, names the unfolding of a relationship between movers and stayers, arising from an unsolicited count, encounter between placed people and displaced people, invaded subjects and invading subjects. So when indigenous peoples survive, like the Yanomami, the Mixtecos, the Maori, the Cree, the Mohawks, they survive as that thing, this particular uh, identity, because they have fought to do so, and they have succeeded. And all the indigenous peoples who don't succeed aren't there anymore as indigenous peoples. They have succeeded, and, and, and they succeed because struggles for placidness and self-possession against pressures of assimilation, dispossession, are at the heart of what Gerald Visenor calls survivance. Not survival, but the art of survivance. How could they not be, then, our experts on, um, on alternatives to the modern myth of travel? This doesn't mean indigenous thinkers are the only people who experience placidness in this way. On the contrary, it's a powerful experience for many people in this country and others, especially people who grew up in rural or wilderness environments. Now, the moral of this story is not that we are all supposed to agree that nobody should travel, I shouldn't have gone to Lima, uh, nothing is learned that way, or that we should avoid seeking out wonderment, the unfamiliar, the experience of freedom, none of that. But we are, I think, called upon or offered the opportunity to, to mess with that modernist myth of travel and the scripts that go with it. So this I'm thinking of as a call for experimentation. And that's what, in Mexico, the Zapatistas did. Experiments, and I'm, uh, this is the last chunk of my talk about the Zapatista experiments, in mobility and placidness. These had, kinds of experiments have been a hallmark of the Zapatista movement's geopolitics. This is an indigenous-based uh, social movement that began in, in Chiapas in Mexico uh, the day that NAFTA was signed, January 1st, 1994, and continues now. So right from the beginning of January 1st, 1994, the Zapatistas defined themselves in terms of a place. Uh, if you were around then, you'll remember we all listened, their communiques all came from La Selva Lacandona de Chiapas, the Lacandon jungle of Chiapas. This was not their ancestral home at all. This was a remote place to which they had been driven by hydroelectric and other projects that had taken over their land bases. From this place of anchoring, they deployed an array of experiments in extroversion and geopolitical engagement. Some of you might remember, in 1996, for example, from the Sel La Selva La Candona, they issued a blanket invitation to the entire world to come to Chiapas and attend a summit on globalization that was <coughs> held in the summer of 1996. A summit on neoliberalism. So they launched this gigantic planetary 
act of hospitality and reversing the idea of the unsolicited encounter. They invited everybody who wanted to come to come. <laughs> Thousands did. They, a global cast of characters descended on Chiapas. And out of that gathering, according to David Graeber, came the activist, the, the transnational activist network that went on to organize the big anti-globalization demonstration in Seattle in 1999, which many of you will remember. That began at this gathering in Chiapas. And Graeber and others went on then to be the key figures organizing the Occupy movement in 2012. So from the placed Placed and placed, placed and placedness of indigen the indigenous, the Zapatistas superseded the colonial script of the unsolicited encounter by soliciting encounter and making themselves the agents of contact. But still, they stayed where they were and people had to come to them. Three years later, in the spring of 1999, they took another bold step. Um, at that point, they were really hemmed in and harassed by the Mexican army. And to kind of try to break out of this, they announced in Mexico, and I was living there at the time, they announced a nationwide, we're going to have a consulta ciudadana, a civic citizens consultation. They announced they were going to send delegations of one man and one woman who, from their members of their popular movement to each of Mexico's 2,500 electoral districts, the municipios, where they would spend a week meeting with anyone who was open to dialogue with them about the conditions they, for their ex, uh, truce with the Mexican government. A call went out. They put out a call to all Mexico saying, OK, in every municipio, each one of these electoral districts, there has to be a host committee who will receive us when we come and raise the money to sustain us. And those committees appeared. It happened. And uh, miraculously, so that in March of 1999, 5,000 indigenous adults, men and women, plus another thousand or so children, traveled. They became the ones who traveled. And they made their fellow, their fellow Mexican citizens took on the role of their hosts. The vast majority of these people had never left their home district. Many, mostly the women in particular, spoke no Spanish. Most of their hosts, who were chambers of commerce, students, teachers, unions, community groups, churches, most of their hosts had never listened to an indigenous language or sat across a table in a conversation with an indigenous person. So the consulta produced innumerable first encounters. A few details are noteworthy. In that experiment, the, 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 set, the Zapatistas did not construct their journey as from margin to center. They didn't converge on Mexico City. They, they went from everywhere, from somewhere to everywhere. And th thus, like the Argentine rider, they identified the nation as the totality of its geography and its people, not as the capital where the government lives. And by sending male-female pairs, they intercepted the sexual scripts, both of, of colonialism and patriarchal hospitality, in which male visitors arrive and females uh, receive them. So the, there, there's much more that could be said about this, but the Zapatistas kind of rewrote the script. And that's they set about to do that. And um, they, rec they reorganized the powers of, of moving and staying and arriving and hosting on, in a redefined way. They also, and this is what I'll end with, they also introduced an interesting new metaphor of mobility to describe their work. I'll, read, I'll say it in Spanish for those who know the language, and then I'll give it in English. El zapatismo, says one of their communiques, no es. No existe, solo sirve como sirven los puentes para cruzar de un lado a otro. Por tanto, en el zapatismo caben todos los que quieran cruzar de uno a otro lado. Zapatismo does not exist. It only serves as bridges serve, to cross from one side to another. Therefore, Zapatismo embraces 
all those who wish to cross from one side to another side. So let me finish with that image of a crossing and a bridge as an invitation for some experiments in new geopolitics and new ecologies of travel. Thank you. I forgot to show you my images of the Zapatista gatherings. <laughs> Hello? Okay. We'll take a few questions uh, for a few minutes. Uh, keep your hands up in case we don't get to you. Uh, we'll get to you as quick and efficiently as possible. Questions, comments, examples, anecdotes? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, is the uh, scourge and the fallacies associated with Ebola going to redefine the purpose of travel and whether from the traveler or from the purpose of the other who's migrating. Oh, what a, what a great uh, topic to raise. Uh, it's making people rethink a lot of things, right? And in a way, um, I think it's, one of the things it's making people rethink is, the, um, is sort of the ecological dimensions of traveling that, you, you know, you, uh, and there's a kind of sense of an entitlement to that Ill, illness has always been a huge part of traveling, right? Wherever we go, we get sick with, because we encounter, uh, you know, toxic, toxic things that we aren't, have no immunity to. So, but, um, but epidemics are, uh, a vi they're actually, it's really, it's really interesting to think of the mobility of an epidemic and its ability to jump from, uh, from place to place. And, um, how that, and, and all the metaphors of invasion come along with the, the, the language of, of epidemic. Um, so I don't know what, where Ebola, do you have an idea of where it, it do you have, what, do you know what you think about this, of what, where it's leading? I think it's just, it is, I'm intrigued by how much it's making us rethink, making people rethink. Yep. Yeah, and I think that in the West, there's a kind of panic when anything impedes our mobility. That's one piece of it, yeah. And then there's tremendous fear because we know the dark side. In a way, it's, our, it's the dark side of, of our mobility that we don't deal with in another way, so it comes out as terror, you know. Great question, thank you. Lots to think about. Uh, I really like your term, unsolicited encounters. Um, I was thinking about it in terms of uh, what in this country is called illegal immigration and whether you can talk about unsolicited encounters um, in relation to um, immigration reform in this country. How were you thinking of it, that Im re immigration reform would produce <coughs> solicited encounters? No. Well, what... Uh, you a lot of what happens, I mean, the, the, uh, when we call someone illegal, what does that mean? Um, is this be only because it was unsolicited, given that all the, a lot of the traveling that we do is unsolicited to other countries? Yeah. But uh -huh. we justify it through economic means. Um, and I'm just wondering if the dynamics could be shifted when it comes to immigration reform, if we start to use other terminology mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, rather than, oh, you're just illegal, so get out. Well, you know, um, the funny part about undocumented immigration in the United States is that it's not necessarily unsolicited. <laughs> uh, there are many, many, uh, 
first of all, I mean, they, in California, where I lived for many years, they used to call the immigra immigrant stream la grifa, which is the faucet. And the growers, when they needed their workers, they would call down to the border and say, turn on the abre la grifa, turn on the faucet. And the undocumented, the undocumented would flow up, would be sent up, and the, the buses would bring them. So uh, undocumented immigration here is not unsolicited. What happens is that if you're not documented, you are in a position, uh, you, have no, you don't have any normal workers' rights, and you're in a position of, of, of vulnerability to exploitation. Um, so then, um, so, so I'm not sure that the, the idea of solicited and unsolicited may not be too illuminating in, in that situation. But it's true that from the point of view of, for example, of Mexico and Central America, for example, there is a sense of, of the right to migrate, el derecho de migrar, that we should, this is a redistribu redistribution, we are, it's correcting horrible economic inequalities, we should be able to go get jobs, decent paying jobs, and send money back to our families, right? And our, we have state structures that don't support their population, so we should be able to do this, especially if there's a demand for our labor. So it's a conversation that just it hasn't happened at the level that it needs to happen. Um, this so. next question is our last question. Oh my god, we ran out of time so quickly. Well then I have to comment and say thank you so much for the mind stretching that you undoubtedly did, I should think for a lot of us at least. Um, one of the first things I think about is the fact and I've heard it many times, that only one-third of our government members have passports. I wonder if you would comment or would like to comment on that in some useful way. <laughs> um, well, there's some of them that I wouldn't want to share with any other country. <laughs> So it's not so bad that they don't go anywhere except home to campaign. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it, it uh, you know, that's an example where we immediately read that as lack of sophistication, lack of education. And to, we, we have to be, I think we, we shouldn't assume any of those things. Um, but it becomes the, the, the signal we can use for talking about something else, which is indeed a kind of um, uh, lack of curiosity about the rest of the world and, the, and the, inabil the difficulty within the United States in the education system of getting access to broad ranges of geographical knowledge. I mean, geography in particular, I, I went to school in Canada where geography, because we were inside the British Empire, geography was the subject, right? Every day your rooms, were, classes were full of these maps that marked what territories the queen ran and where, you know, where she had, wasn't and, and uh, so, but in the U.S. really that kind of global geo geographical consciousness isn't something that's cultivated, it's much more national. So that produces this kind of, that's one of the things that produces this kind of um, lack that we, that we feel people need. And um, so I'm not, I'm not sure, I have to, I, I've always cited that passport uh, example myself and said look at that, how ignorant and provincial everybody is, but then I think, you know what, that's inside the myth too, so I'm not, I just have to think about it a little more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.